Good afternoon, dear participants. Sorry, we had some technical issues. Uh, welcome to our today's webinar, uh, Transfer Pricing Audit Support and Controversy. Uh, I'm happy to present you our today's panelist, Maju Van Wok, who is a partner in TPA Amsterdam. She's uh, uh, in the industry for 14 years, and her previous experience includes 10 years of in-house tax counsel with a focus on international tax planning. Our second panelist is Igor Peters, who is also a partner in TPA Amsterdam. Uh, he has more than 18 years of experience in international taxation and transfer pricing. His previous experience also includes in-house tax counsel in Germany and Netherlands. The yeah, participants, welcome, and you can start the webinar. Uh, let's wait uh, one or two minutes for everybody to join. Uh, for Okay, thank you very much for your uh, patience. Yeah, we gave you the couple of minutes for everybody to be able to uh, log in to the webinar. Thank you, Mary. Uh, quickly, the um, contents of the webinar of today, uh, public scrutiny and transparency relating to uh, all its timeline of disputes, uh, something about uh, being in control, dispute avoidance and dispute resolution tools, case selection, one example of um, audit, preparation for a transfer pricing audit, and then we, uh, if time is still uh, left, you might go into uh, Discussion. discussions and, or some details perhaps. Okay, let's move to slide number four. A little bit background on uh, tax and TP audits. And, uh, the current uh, situation is that there is also much more public scrutiny and also the public demands much more transparency. And one of the, I think, outcomes of that is the reports that the OECD published regarding BEPS, the base erosion and profit shifting and all their action against it. So if we see in this cycle uh, one important element, the limitation of the tax effective interest deductibility as seen in action number four, um, that might give raise to more uh, controversy. PE risk exposure if you take into account action number seven, the importance of um, PEs and the proposed measures and it will give rise to much more taxable presence of companies outside their home country, which uh, next to the question whether or not there is a PE gives rise to the much more difficult question how much profit to allocate to these uh, taxable presence. And then the EU, together with the action number 13, proposes to have any tax rulings published. But the EU, in that sense, also focuses on possible state aids. And recently, I think they also mentioned the possible audit outcomes. The audit settlements might also be scrutinized for scrutinized, being checked for possible being uh, state aid. Then we have uh, action number two, abolition of hybrid structures, also giving uh, yeah, for sure ammunition to uh, tax controversy and TP controversy. And then I think one of the most important elements, action number eight, nine, and ten, and with a strong focus on the people functions and the risk management. And risk management, say they much further elaborate on, on how to do that and how to mitigate that. And they provided now the six steps of risk management. So tax authorities are digging into that. I think most uh, recent actions were was in France, uh, where the French tax authorities, uh, I think there were 50 or 100 people uh, involved in the audit on Google. And 
now what, what I understood they really uh, took some data some some five terabyte of data so for the next five years they will be investigating uh, emails and other uh, communications that, that were stored and the, in the, the computer expert early in the morning took all the uh, yeah, and data think, and computers yeah that's that's I think also what you've seen in in yeah, your your case where where you were working on that there was an EDP audit and uh, emails were being investigated by tax authorities. So on the other hand, now of course you know and you can also Maybe use profiles. Yeah. Use your your email communication to back up that you were actually performing this risk management and, and how uh, decision making processes can be elaborated by by showing email trails and use it as your uh, audit trails. And on the right side of the slide, uh, before, now yeah, before 2013 or 2015, before before now, and there was a strong focus on planning, perhaps aggressive uh, tax and TP planning, and less on being compliant. I think nowadays the focus is uh, much more on being compliant and then yeah, even stronger and not uh, mere compliant in, in the way what are the regulations asking to be compliant but also more yeah, a fair share way of being compliant. Uh, everything is uh, exposed in uh, the public domain. So with that like uh, to hand over to the to Margie and we go to the next slide. Thanks Igor. Time, slide 5, timeline of disputes. How to address the increased level of tax and transfer pricing disputes as a result of the BEPS project. As a first step for building a thorough framework, you can think of a timeline of conflicts which represents the actions of the taxpayer and the tax authorities in relation to a tax or transfer pricing issue. This timeline showcases the options available to the taxpayer to prevent a dispute and the ones available after a dispute arises. All the options listed to the left of the turning point, like filing of a tax return, are covered under dispute avoidance because they are the precautionary measures available to the taxpayer before the tax returns are received and analyzed by the tax authorities. Timely and efficient adoptions of these measures can increase the taxpayer's chances of avoiding a dispute with the tax authorities uh, upon an, an analysis, analysis of its tax returns. Once the tax return has been submitted, the tax authorities may select the taxpayer's case on the basis of many factors. Thus, even if you have complied with all the preparatory dispute avoidance options, it is still possible that the case may be selected by the tax authorities for an audit, of course. Once a case has been selected and an assessment have, has been made, you may not be in agreement with such assessment. And this leads to disputes which can then be resolved via the options listed to the right of the turning point in the timeline, as shown in the picture. Uh, the following example presents the application of dispute avoidance and resolutions measures as listed in the timeline. The application of the safe harbor rules is listed as the first tool under dispute avoidance and can be seen in the example of Company X. Company X is a global provider of high quality signal transmission solutions and it designs, manufactures and markets high-speed electronic cables and connectivity products and related items for the specialty uh, market on electronics and data networking. Uh, in 2013, Company X restructured to more efficiently identify and capture attractive growth opportunities. But the new organizational design initiated the use of global business platforms instead of a traditional regional structure for provision of various types of support services to the local subsidiaries. 
of company X. Uh, such, ser such services create an economic benefit to the local operations of the subsidiaries and the costs are therefore allocated to these beneficiaries. Now, as uh, per the OECD guidelines, any transfer-pricing re regulation has to reflect arm's length pricing for provision of intercompany services as well. It can be challenging to, to justify different markups applied in respect of provision of support services by the global business platforms to subsidiaries located in different regions of the world. So, as such, you can think of designing a standard profile of these services and preparing transfer pricing documentation to justify a fixed markup to be applied in respect of provision of such services across all regions. This allows then uh, for a simplified transfer pricing approach to be applied for provision of support services, so a creation of a safe harbor for these specific services. Um, and then setting up a framework of such a standardized benchmarks and write-ups that, that need to be updated later or can be updated yearly uh, in relation to pricing of headquarters services or regional shared services or other routine services low value adding services, etc. This has the advantage that it can be efficiently and quickly customized into a report to suit the needs of the taxpayer, dealing on the various levels within the group with global headquarters support services or global business unit support services and regional shared service center support services. Um, also, a new way of managing a mitigated TP risk is through obtaining an ISO 9001 certification on transfer pricing. The ISO certificate focuses on quality management, this is the ISO 9001, and risk management, and the ISO certificate number here is 31010, based on the analysis of the TP risks involved. And then by allowing business processes to comply with ISO requirements, multinational will, in an integrated manner, increase uh, transfer pricing operational efficiency and subsequently better mitigate the risks, these risks. This is yet another example of alignment of corporate government and risk management. An ISO 9001 certification on transfer pricing and anti-corruption is, is a quality management system which evidences that companies take this issue seriously, now, seriously nowadays. So ISO certification um, means that corporate corporations pay a small, so to say, uh, insurance fee for significant potential significant benefits. Uh, such as establishing quality systems and mitigating high TP risks, uh, achieving awareness, and uh, last but not least, maintaining their reputations. Less accounting questions, yeah. I guess, from your external yeah. accountant. Yeah, more, and more straightforward, at least, for answering, for responding to, to them if they arise. And the Indian tax authorities, for example, are of the view that ISO certification could certainly be accepted as an evidence of conformity to good practice processes. And an example is also Hennes and Maurit, which has implemented an ISO 9001 certification to improve its business processes and reduce its tax-related risks. Um, another dispute avoidance tool is obtaining multilateral or unilateral APAs. In 2004, multilateral APAs were concluded for the first time within the EU. Namely, a multilateral APA was signed by Airbus Industries and the tax administrations of France and Germany, the UK and Spain. And Euronext and ClearNet also concluded a multilateral APA with the tax administrations of Belgium, France, and the Netherlands. 
and multilateral APAs have since then become a popular instrument of dispute avoidance and, and have proven to be much more reliable than unilateral APAs. Um, in the picture, in the turning point column, we see horizontal supervision. Horizontal supervision is a concept based on mutual trust, so an open relationship between a taxpayer and a tax administration in which tax issues can be handled quickly. As a result, work can be carried out as far as possible in the present and therefore reducing the need for intensive retrospective auditing. In order to apply this principle, the tax administration demands a certain degree of security from the taxpayer in the form of a well-established and transparent risk management system, uh, so a, a so-called tax control framework. Um, an example can be seen at the Dutch tax administration that allows for horizontal supervision if the taxpayer fulfills the requirement of internal risk management. At the minimum, this requires companies to disclose meaningful information on tax policies employed and policy or government frameworks. An additional confidence can be derived from transparency around tax payments, provided such disclosure is adequate to allow investors to properly assess how the company's tax strategy is being realized in practice. And also the level of disclosure should be appropriate to the structure of each company's own business and should help even a non-technical audience avoid misinterpretations. Horizontal supervision can be compared to pre-audit settlement as it involves negotiation and discussions with the tax authorities over a potential area of dispute without going through the strict procedures of an audit. And two examples of such practices are the following. Unilever, as a part of the sustainable living section on their website, has a page on tax that includes a set of global tax principles and a summary of taxes paid by type and region. And DSM has produced a comprehensive position paper on its approach to tax, which includes its policy, governance, data on the economic value generated and distributed, and an analysis of its global effective tax rate. But even after following multiple strategies for avoidance of disputes, your case may be selected by tax authorities for an audit. Um, the, the most common reasons or structures inviting for an audit uh, can be categorized uh, as follows. Um, firstly, location of sale and marketing hubs in low-tax jurisdiction. An example of these structures can be found in the mining industries, which are currently being heavily challenged by the Australian Tax Authority and the South African Revenue Services. Uh, secondly, the use of cost contribution arrangements uh, in case they do not reflect a clear link between the location of the value-adding activities and the location of the persons responsible for, for performing the same. Typical cash box structures belong to this category. Um, and and in, 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 when they employ uh, an offshore entity for locating all the profits generating through a CCA cost contribution agreement while the active management of the CCA is performed by persons located in a high tax jurisdiction. A third category are the R&D centers which create value or RP at one location while the ownership of that IP is located in another jurisdiction. And these are at risk of a tax audit as well. Um, in addition to these structures, a case may also be selected for an audit on the basis of a political motive behind it, rather than on the basis of clear facts that will hold up in a courtroom. 
uh, we saw this recently in the case of Google's tax settlement in the UK. You ref you refer to France, but they also have more cases pending in Italy as well as in the UK. And this UK settlement uh, has been heavily criticized uh, in France, amongst others, because HMRC accepted Google's claim that its UK staff only plays a supporting role to Google's main European operation in Dublin. The biggest claims or comments were, I think, coming from the US, uh, like, oh, you're bashing uh, yeah. US tech uh, companies. Why yeah. don't you invent your own uh, tech right. companies, European tech companies? So, political statement. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, so with all this, uh, it is highly recommended that the multinationals, of course, play a proactive role in developing a dispute avoidance and risk management mechanism in order to avoid the tax audit, um, even if the penalties levied by the tax authorities may be negotiated and reduced, a reputational damage caused by the absence of a risk management mechanism can be heavenly impact a multinational in a negative way, as we have seen recently in many cases. And um, in, on this point, to avoid leakage of tax sensitive information, you can think of the following. Um, um, make a record of your tax specific information. Decide three preferred channels of getting that information to the market, but also decide three least preferred channels to get that information to the market. And lastly, decide the best ways to mitigate leakage of tax sensitive information through the least preferred channels. What do you mean getting info to the market? Yeah, to the any stakeholders. Right, or? through the website. Yeah, oh, okay. exactly. Okay. In, or in the news, but that might be the, if that is not uh, mm -hmm. monitored, might be a least preferred channel. Um, yeah, we move to slide six. Are you in control? Um, so, um, in order to be able to avoid or resolve disputes, uh, as a first step, multinationals need to be in control of their operations. Being in control consists of completion of the following three activities. One, uh, running a compliance cycle, uh, creating a proper and timely risk management structure, as we saw before. And thirdly, dealing proactively with dispute resolution. Um, the figure on slide six captures the differences between a company that is in control and one that is not. As can be seen in the figure, a company in control completes proactively its corporate processes even before a stage of case selection by the tax authorities. And such corporate processes may include amending non-compliant transactions and restructuring harmful arrangements in order to prevent its case from getting selected for a review by tax authorities. For a company in control, the third stage almost never materializes. And even if it does, the company is prepared to prove to the tax authorities the arm's length nature of its transactions. A company that is in control complies with the tax and transfer pricing regulations in all of its locations, and it undertakes adequate steps for avoidance of any risks and disputes, and it prepares for the possibility of dispute resolution. This is in clear contrast to a company that is not in control. Such a company does not take a proactive role in straightening its corporate processes beforehand. And hence, if such a company deals in the high-risk industries, it is likely to be selected by the tax authorities for review and possibly also for an audit, uh, because it lacks appropriate preparations. As can be seen in the figure, 
a company that is not in control gets hit by a tax audit even before it has had the chance to complete its compliance procedures in all of the locate countries of its operations. And in this case, the company is hardly in a position to defend its transactions as it has to spend it, as it has spent no time on proactively designing strategies for avoiding disputes and especially in the light of, of uh, the increasing pressure from the tax authorities on the BEPS, the company can, up, can end up with paying much more tax, including penalties uh, and adjustments. Um, we move to slide seven. Dispute avoidance and dispute resolution tools. This picture shows various options to be used in order to pre prevent or resolve disputes with tax authorities. Um, unilateral proactive. This category, category refers to dispute avoidance measures that can be unilaterally pursued by the taxpayer, such as completion of all transfer pricing documentation, proving the existing existence of arm's length prices for all intercompany transactions, pre-audit settlements with the tax authorities, APAs, etc. Unilateral measures can be quite effective if, use, if use, utilized efficiently and in time, as they prevent the existence of any disputes. However, with the increased use of intangibles by businesses, measures such as the as an unilateral APA may not provide complete protection as it only represents the view of the competent authority of one jurisdiction in which the taxpayer operates and the competent authority in any other jurisdiction may not agree with that analysis. And so a multilateral dispute avoidance measure may allow for more certainty and that's the, the next uh, quarter a multilateral proactive. This category refers to dispute avoidance measures as well that are available to the taxpayer which represent the view of more than one tax authority. Some examples can be multilateral APAs, uh, of course, and use of the safe harbor rules employed by countries and the ISO certification. Multilateral dispute avoidance measures can offer more certainty with regard to avoidance of a, dis of a dispute rather than their unilateral counterparts, uh, but also here uh, due to the increased use of intangibles and also uh, more complicated ways of conducting a business, the critical conditions set at the time of framing the APA may differ from the actual conduct and we see that that is very important, it has become very important on the BEPS, the actual conduct carried out by the taxpayer in the later years and then any, anyway thereby leading to a dispute. Mm, then we have unilateral reactive. Once an assessment has been made and the taxpayer is not in agreement with the same, it is allowed to pursue a unilateral dispute resolution measures. Such schemes could include settlement of the dispute before a tax tribunal or local court proceedings or arbitration under public international law. These measures can only be initiated by the taxpayer himself or upon a request by himself, uh, but the mechanism for doing so differs, differs from country to country. Um, then the last quarter is regarding multilateral reactive. Um, if a dispute has not been resolved on the, any of the other the three options, the other three options, there are um, still some options available to the taxpayer to seek multilateral resolution of disputes, and these include arbitration under the bilateral tax treaties or the EU in convention, if applicable, or any other form of mutual agreement procedure, which is available in the country of the taxpayer. Okay, thank you. Yeah, when, when um, from uh, that, that's of course mainly from a uh, taxpayer point of view. And next slide. 
Uh, this would be more from the view of uh, tax authorities. How would do they? How would they? And select a case which which company uh, to audit. And you have several elements: uh, case selection, and who is uh, of concern. I think step one: uh, broad industry analysis to identify the products uh, and uh, entities and companies involved. You have to understand the expected tax behaviors and possible outcomes and identify features that may indicate a possible tax concern. And then you need to understand the, the market. So you need to analyze the market. And for example, also tax authorities use here the so-called five forces from uh, Porter and to gain insights about prices and costs that might be reasonable, be expected for the products and then identifies those who appear to deviate from this significantly. And some uh, knowledge of the, the business is required to make this uh, first step in the case selection. So you need to analyze the business against the peer group of the business and of course against the past performance. That might be an indicator of uh, yeah, important business restructured restructuring uh, due to which the taxable profits uh, significantly uh, dropped. Um, do a profitability analysis, so analyze the profitability between the peer group, between similar MEs, and then identify those which appear to have a very low profitability compared to their peers. And then, of course, analyze the uh, relevant functions performed in, uh, in your jurisdiction. Of course, at a very high level, and then yeah, that, that will provide, I think, your first uh, filter of, of entities or companies that are selected. Then in a phase two, uh, I think part, part of it you can also read in the OECD's handbook for tax audits for uh, tax authorities. And phase two, uh, uh, tax inspector will do is make a risk assessment. So again, uh, understanding the the value chain in the industry is investigated and the possible associated tax issues and what are the possible indicators that reveal the existence of such tax issues, what, what is happening in the market and how does that influence the company and the likelihood of tax consequences, what's happening in the business, so understand the business economic and tax performance, understand possible reasons for any divergence in, in key ratios and balances, I think that will, yeah. It's, it's currently, I think, already performed by uh, companies themselves that did already a first dry run for their uh, C by C and then uh, apply some ratios and see what's, what's happening. Are certain entities totally out of line compared to the well, general profitability or general uh, uh, ratio of, of staff available, FTEs uh, available? So this, this uh, one will be much yeah, stronger and easier present, I think, in the coming years for tax authorities. Also, right, comparing it, uh, indicators for tax authorities are, of course, uh, comparisons either with the past or with your uh, peer group. So they make um, a profitability analysis. So they examine financial accounts over time, several, usually four or five years in a row and understand the possible reasons for their uh, tax performance that might be below a reasonable uh, expectation. Again, a little bit deeper, but now uh, uh, initial functional review and identify the relevant functions that appear to be significant and of uh, concern because they trigger the, the relevant tax issues. So then you get into the phase three, 
the, the actual tax audit. So what's happening here? And they are collecting the data from the taxpayer and auditing the evidence that's being provided by the taxpayer. So a typical process uh, uh, consists of four steps to, to uh, analyze and audit transfer prices. So step one would be there to identify the actual conditions, so collect and review the facts and evidence as provided. Step two, then analyze, identify and adjust for possible comparable circumstances that are relevant to the arm's length condition. Select the best arm's length method for it. And then step three, apply the transfer pricing rules in order to achieve consistency with the relevant guidance material, be it the OECD guidelines, the UN guidelines, or country specific uh, guidelines. And step four, then update and or amend the relevant transfer prices that you investigated if uh, necessary. And then you need to decide on a possible rollback or roll forward of, of uh, your findings. And of course, monitor ongoing compliance with the taxpayer. Important phase also for uh, tax authority is the resolution of possible uh, issues found and resolve the adjustments with the taxpayer and especially uh, in, the, in the field of transfer pricing, resolve the issues with other relevant tax administrations, for example, in uh, a MAP mutual agreement procedure. And then yeah, you're still tax inspector, so you will identify who else in industry or market may have similar issues. And then perhaps a little bit more from a legislative or regulatory point of view. And you might consider that it's needed to provide additional guidance or uh, additional compliance action that is needed or required by, by the relevant uh, industry. So back to the perspective of uh, the taxpayer, move to slide number nine. And how can you prepare for a transfer pricing audit? And before the audit is, uh, if you look at the, the picture in the middle, before the audit is uh, after the audit. Let's start at uh, the pre-audit phase. And you have uh, focus, uh, focus on your transfer pricing risks, and you would like to do that uh, proactively. So one of the first steps is already uh, determine the need and the, the purpose you have of your TP documentation. I think of the four layers being your uh, local file, your master file, you have uh, one or two years, depending on the country, you receive by C report, you have to file. And certain countries already ask for a yeah, kind of fourth layer, your TP form. Usually it's an appendix to your yearly tax return, corporate income tax return, where you make already a more detailed financial overview of, of transactions, sometimes even a little bit in the format of executive summary of your local file and you show something of your value chain. Um, therefore, create, prepare or maintain your TP documentation and you can check already are all the relevant intercompany legal agreements in place, uh, have they been signed, do the relevant entities avail of or signed copies and that's not the um, main attention of the legal department, so you really have to uh, push on, on uh, that one to get them in place. Check whether the TP documents which are likely to be reviewed, uh, are they complete already? Are they really final? Do they have all the appendices in place with uh, uh, like, like the ones mentioned in the TP forms with uh, actual numbers? Uh, 
going back to slide number eight, in the, the case selection, also tax authorities will, of course, apply kind of 80-20 rule and not go for the, the small transactions. Um, important, and check your uh, transfer pricing maintenance, maintenance and disclosure manual, uh, who in the process is allowed to hand over information to tax authorities. Uh, what is exactly the information? Do you need internal pre-approval to hand it over? Um, yeah, do you have your, your rulings in place? Are you really sure that the rulings are also actually followed in your uh, financial bookkeeping? Um, yeah, you can start preparing by looking similar like, like your tax inspector will do. Look at the uh, audit outcome of the preceding uh, tax audit and see whether the findings from that moment have been updated or eliminated or that you know already that they will pop up again in this uh, audit. Now to make it, if, if you're in a much bigger multinational, of course, you need a kind of global audit monitoring dashboard and, and also part of your risk uh, management tool, which uh, years are still open for an audit, which years are closed. And of course, keep an eye on any industry and other uh, developments. And what, what is still pre-audit, uh, you will receive the audit announcement. So make sure that you have sufficient and reasonable time to get prepared for your TP audit. Do not simply accept any starting date if it is too rush or it's your uh, well holiday. If you can postpone it and be prepared, that will official for you. Therefore ask the tax inspector or the tax auditor in advance for the relevant information of the audit and what will be the estimated time scope to uh, complete the audit, which exactly which financial years and which taxes will be examined. Uh, of course inform your TP advisor of the coming uh, audit as early as possible. We can be of your uh, assistance there. <laughs> and try to determine the character of the audit. Is it a normal uh, periodic uh, audit or are there specific reasons for the audit to be performed? I'm referring to the um, slide number eight, case selection. If, if yeah, your, your company for some reason severely dropped in, in profitability compared to the peer group, and then there is a different reason for uh, tax audits. Sometimes it's uh, a claim from other, uh, from, from your competitors, and they see uh, profits are, are dropping. So indirectly, there might be a claim that you're dumping your products. So that it's kind of backdoor for uh, anti-dumping, but it's might also be a tax reason for that. So then you have uh, yeah, kind of non-standard, non-periodical uh, tax audit. And in case of any possible disputes on transactions related to goods, check with your uh, TP consultant as soon as possible whether there is possibly need to also adjust or uh, reconsider any uh, custom duty impact that, that's coming from your TP policy. Try to pre preview what information will possibly be asked and check whether this information is readily available and is also uh, checked by you. So uh, you're, you're happy to hand it over. Of course, internally, you should conduct already a high level check on potential transfer pricing risks areas. For instance, uh, business restructuring changes, which might have had an impact on your uh, TP policy and is not reflected yet in your uh, documentation. I assume the tax inspector will also not only be speaking uh, initially probably to the, the head of tax, quite often he would also ask or invite operational managers 
controllers. And, uh, so you also need to prepare them and what to, to inform them. Stick to the uh, relevant years. And don't have them suddenly uh, explaining your current business restructuring. And that's out of scope of your audit. So check for any recent business developments that impacted your TP uh, policy. Check the previous discussions. Also discuss that with the relevant uh, tax inspector. Right? What did you do internally to resolve the um, issues that popped up during the, the predecessing uh, audit? Uh, you might receive questionnaires from your uh, TP auditor and also ask for minutes of the meeting you have. It's quite important, I think, every time to get everything in writing from the tax authorities and not too much uh, rely on oral or verbal information provided. So during the audit itself, and the uh, revenue officials will uh, present themselves. Well, just a simple start. Check for their ID. So you have the right persons, and they do really uh, exist in front of you. And I think very important, prepare for an opening meeting during which you can provide some background information to the company, a quick 15, 10 minute uh, PowerPoint presentation where you can elaborate already on your uh, value chain will help also the tax inspector to much more quickly understand what the company is doing and what perhaps the, the typical um, elements are of the industry where the company is operating. Totally in the line of that thinking. Yeah, BB is... Uh, Exactly as transparent as uh, possible. And yeah, funny enough, uh, also myself, it's always interesting to see, uh, offer the tax inspector to be shown around the company. It's, uh, they highly, like that, yeah. It's highly appreciated. Assuming you're not in the uh, in, uh, office Can garden. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, yeah, but it it's, yeah, really helps him to, to or your understand the business. And during this uh, initial opening meeting, I make some uh, procedural arrangements. For instance, uh, appoint a, a direct contact person uh, to which the relevant tax inspector can turn with his questions. Assign an employee as a direct contact person who then can supply the information requested by the auditor and also take care of his or her other needs. I show the tax inspector which room he can use. Make sure it's a normal room, not old-fashioned, a dark and noisy and cold one. For the use of the entire tax audit period, also inform all your other colleagues that they yeah, are aware tax audit is going on and do not communicate too frankly and constantly refer to direct contact uh, person. Um, after you've, you've dealt with it, uh, do it in writing. Uh, write down your procedure arrangements and be very sure to be explicit on the point that the TP auditor is forbidden to just wander uh, aimlessly around your company and, and start uh, talking to well, anybody else than the direct contact uh, person. As mentioned, alert the other uh, personnel of the TP audit and inform them that the communication with the TP auditor is to be channeled to the direct contact person only. Uh, the, the important role of this uh, direct con contact person uh, he or she needs to manage all the questions and questionnaires that arrive from the TP auditor, manage and centralize all the answers to be provided to the TP auditor, and they also check what is the expected timeline for providing those answers, which form sometimes also as quickly as possible, deal with possible uh, language issues, so asking for his uh, skills of English language, I guess. 
and it's very important to keep a track on all questions and questionnaires that you've received, including all the answers and information and documents you've provided. Of course, written records are preferable in this case. And make uh, very sure that anything, uh, questions or questionnaires you receive, that they are put in writing. Arrange the meetings and the same conduct. Question. Sorry. And same question can also be asked in different ways. Yeah. From different perspectives. Yeah, quite often. Uh, they're, yeah. They're, they're, yeah, you would expect also as a tax inspector some consistency in the uh, answers. And also arrange and set up the relevant uh, meetings and uh, yeah, the conduct regarding the communication. If the TP auditor has any questions to ask to specific employees in the company and not being then the direct contact person and of course offer to make copies of documents where the TP auditor thinks it is uh, important for his audit. Throughout the whole audit period and try to stay regularly updated of his uh, uh, sometimes daily findings or opinions on the uh, company. So try to stay in regular contact and have interactions with the TP auditor. Have, uh, possible daily or end of the week or regular conversations with the TP auditor and therefore schedule periodic uh, evaluation meetings to discuss any progress or uh, if they pop up any uh, potential issues. And most important, arrange a closing meeting uh, where on the findings from the TP auditor and the possibility where, where you can discuss the, the proposed adjustments and very important in the course of your TP audit uh, determine and evaluate the relevant audit strategy with your TP advisor. So after the audit and like, like I said it's, it's before the audit so you can again learn from all the findings and you will receive a final audit report from your auditor based on that and you have to uh, evaluate your audit results and evaluate most likely or, or in some cases your TP policy uh, evaluate whether you apply the correct controversy strategy and immediately consider impact for other countries uh, topic that, that uh, relates to a certain intercompany transaction might be uh, pop, pop up during any audit for a similar transaction in other countries. Uh, consider APA strategy to uh, eliminate uh, adjustments and perhaps you can solve it uh, partially for the future and uh, past with uh, rollback APA or sometimes yeah, you might need to do some litigation if you really don't agree or instead of litigation you might uh, especially I think for the Netherlands you have a kind of uh, pre or very early uh, MAP procedure and contact the relevant competent authority uh, as soon as possible. So after your internal evaluation between uh, you, the taxpayer, and the relevant uh, tax inspector, and perhaps also the TP advisor, check uh, whether uh, you have any uh, purposes to prevent potential TP disputes for the future, and therefore perhaps apply for APAs, and determine your strategy and how to address further or similar TP audits in countries with uh, similar uh, transactions. With that, I think we also have some questions. Uh, yeah, uh, one question here. The slides will be uploaded to the website, so yeah, most right likely after, yeah. Yeah, either right after or at least end of this week, including the, including the recording. recording of this 
webinar. Um, do we still have? Uh, yeah, we have five minutes. Time. A few slides to go. So feel free to address any questions you might have via the chat box functions, as we have uh, conveniently muted everybody just to to avoid too much background noise for everybody. Let me quickly. Are there any questions or? Questions here. Just send you all uh, short chat so you see where the chat function is if you have any questions. If you have time, we have a few slides on regional specific. Shall we continue? Or? Yeah, let's do that okay. and then we can always uh, pause with that if questions pop yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's go to slide number. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Just a few comments on the on the different regions uh, worldwide, as they have uh, different dispute avoidance and resolution measures. And uh, North America, um, this region has highly developed dispute uh, measures and re and the resolution measure avoidance and resolution measures. Um, and uh, as the number of civil cases filed each year has increased, and court resources are stretched. Are we fine? Okay. Yeah, or, or perhaps I think this is relating to okay. uh, our remarks. On yeah. The, uh, the question is um, whether the, the ISO 9001 certification is recognized by the tax authorities. Can you elaborate yeah, well, on that? In, the, in India, for example, does recognize it, and at least it is more and more acknowledged by tax authorities that it is an important, uh, um, yeah, it, it has added value to the risk management profile of a company. Yeah, my, my, where, where I've seen it, the uh, ISO certification, it was actually limited to all the intercompany charges from the yeah, headquarter, my, and so much the yeah. staff support or support staff functions like the legal, tax, accounting, and finance departments, IT, uh, and typically the cost plus charges or cost plus uh, zero charges coming from the headquarter or regional uh, headquarters uh, or divisional headquarters. The, yeah. Those and uh, all the, the processes around it were then certified or tested and then uh, ISO certified. Yeah. And that yeah, gave so much comfort to tax authorities, yeah. but in, initially already to the external accountant, so it also eliminated the, the yeah, double or triple checking of those charges by the accountant already. Yeah, and, and also uh, we saw the example of Hannes and Maurits, also for part of the, of the, of the business processes. But for like, like as implemented okay. an ISO yeah. 9001 uh, certification for, yeah. for the more yeah. complex transactions. Yeah, not. Yeah, well, it, yeah, yeah, for its business processes in general, and um, but also uh, to reduce its tax-related risk. So it was linked yeah. with tax okay. transfer Good. Yeah. Sorry but we for are, the interruption. Yeah, no, or no, yeah. I think we. It's uh, this time, right? So very good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for your attention today. And yeah, as mentioned, I think in in one or two days, yeah. we will organize that uh, recording is available on the website of TPA, and also that all the slides, including I think two or three slides that we were not able to discuss. Yeah. Present. If you have any specific questions on the last uh, four slides, uh, please send us an email. Where do we have That's one good. minute? Yeah. Or, okay. To what extent? Uh, the question is: To what extent do you see these concepts as being essentially driven by head office, or should individual countries wait for headquarter to take the lead and give direction? Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, it depends. Uh, I think a little bit on the 
perhaps company culture, whether yeah, you are and, able to uh, give some suggestions to the headquarters. Yeah, on the one side, but also the country, how it is progressing with new legislation on the other side. Yeah, it's good to inform if, if uh, that, that's a role of the headquarters to, to monitor this or whether you have much more uh, autonomy. If they are in control, perform, uh, the headquarters will, control. will address. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, within uh, multinational you can uh, make use of best practices so in that sense. Yeah, there is not a reason not to inform them. No, and that might be included already as a process in the in the risk management uh, framework. framework. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much, and hope to see you in uh, I think two weeks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.